All right, welcome back. Um, we're here for part two, um, and we have some uh, some additional bills that we'll be hearing this <laughs> evening. So I am reconvening um, Education Policy <laughs> Committee. Um, and we have uh, up, ready to go, to our first bill of the, of the evening, House File 4083, um, Representative Chair Joachim. Um, we, we are, um, we will consider this bill also for, uh, for including in our, in a final policy bill, but we also will be, um, entertaining a motion to, um, uh, send this bill to the general register. And so, um, we'll be taking a vote on that. So we'll begin by, um, moving the bill before. So chair, you, Akeem, would you please motion house file 4083 before the committee to be re-referred to the general register? Um, uh, Chair Breyer, that is my motion, and I also have an A2 amendment. All right, and uh, if you, any mention of the A2 amendment, and then we'll approve the A2. The A2 amendment reflects the discussions that I've been having with MSPA and the Principals Association to meet some of their concerns. Okay, all right, thank you. All right, so Chair Yuakim moves the A2 amendment. Any discussion of the A2? All right, all in favor of the A2, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, the A2 amendment is adopted. And Chair, please begin your, ch your presentation. Thank you, Chair Pryor. And I'd like to thank um, the co-authors on this bill, especially Representative Erdahl, who I was hoping would be here tonight. Um, he's been with me on this bill for almost every step of the way. I started working on this bill in 2017 when a group of journalism teachers and students approached me and asked to bring forward this important issue. While it did not get a hearing that year, we did pass it out of the House in 2020, and we're back here again today because it is more important than ever before for our students to learn media literacy, the standards of objective journalism, and critical thinking. We need this bill because we are living in a day and age of instant mass media where the art of objective journalism is being lost and critical thinking has gone by the wayside in 280 characters or less. Students need to learn how to think and communicate critically and effectively wherever their career path or high school, um, after high school takes them. To do this, they need to be able to practice. And what safer place to practice than a controlled environment of a school under the supervision of a trained media advisor and without the fear of complete censorship stifling their passion to learn? Members, there's a reason why the press is considered the fourth branch of government. It helps to shape our democracy and to keep it honest. That is one of the reasons why I went to school for journalism, that and the inspiration of Edward R. Murrow. Teaching journalism in our secondary schools also helps to prepare our future leaders to be civically engaged. But some of our students are not getting that opportunity. Their voices and thoughts are hushed before they're even given a chance to take flight. They are self-censoring for fear of not being able to publish. And a few, a few over the years have been outright censored by their districts. I would also argue that this bill gives much needed clarity to school administration on when and when they cannot censor a student journalist in something to point to in statute. This bill defines school sponsored media, school officials, student journalists and student media advisors in subdivision one. In subdivision two, you'll see what is protected conduct of a student journalist. You will see um, defined what is unprotected speech in subdivision three and in subdivision four, is the requirement for schools to adopt a student journalism policy. I want to um, draw your attention to subdivision three because this is what is where the districts are allowed to have authorized prior restraint on a student journalist. And this is unprotected mm -hmm. speech. If you look in subdivision three, and I know it's really long, it's been a long day for everybody, so I'll just read them really quickly. Um, if speech is defamatory, is preferred, profane, harassing, threatening, or intimidating, constitutes an unwarranted invasion of privacy, so signals out a child, uh, student, or a teacher too much, violates federal or state law, causes a material and substantial disruption of school activities, or is directed to inciting or producing imminent lawless action on school premise, or the violation of lawful school policies or rules, including a policy adopted in accordance with the sections in 128.03 and 031, which is our student bullying policy. So members, those are the areas where, where, as you see with the amendments, 
Um, a school district must must not authorize any prior restraint of school sponsored media except under subdivision three. So those are the unprotected um, expressions for our student journalists. And it follows along the um, Supreme Court state uh, case in Tinker, which some of the testifiers will be talking about later today. There have been 16 states where similar language has become law for high school journalists over the last decade. Washington, Oregon, Nevada, California, Colorado, Kansas, North Dakota, Iowa, Illinois, Arkansas, Vermont, New Jersey, Maine, Rhode Island, Maryland, and Hawaii. They have charted the way and it's time for Minnesota to catch up. Um, but you have heard enough from me. I want to who'd like to turn the testimony over to the real experts in the room, the students and their teachers, and you also have written letters of support in your packets as well. All right, first up I have Jeff Bucur, Publications Advisors from Hopkins High School. And then Jessica Wagner, I believe you're on deck and appreciate that. And you can introduce yourself and proceed. Thank you, Chair Pryor. Members, my name is Jeff Coker. I'm a journalism advisor, publications advisor at Hopkins High School. I have advised media at Hopkins for the last 23 years. I'm a Dow Jones News Fellow, a former Minnesota State Journalist, Journalism Teacher of the Year, and I hold a master's in journalism and education. And I want to thank you and thank Representative Joachim for agreeing to address this issue to protect student freedoms in the classroom. As she mentioned, uh, this is not a new issue. It's something that we have discussed in our state before. It's something that we are following other states. And there are several states that have had this in place since the 1980s. And you'll see them operating successfully. We hear the virtue of freedom used in much of our political discourse, and it's held up as one of the hallmarks of our democracy. It's in our politics, it's embedded in social study standards as we study the fight for freedom up to and including the battles that we wage today. It's a standard that we must teach about these freedoms and the government's role in protecting those freedoms through classes on both citizenship and government. This year in Minnesota, we have a real opportunity to join these 16 other states to create an environment that actually allows for the robust application of these lessons and these principles that are part of our state standards. House file 4083 will help protect student voices and engage them in a civic democracy. I've worked alongside student journalists at Hopkins High School for the past 23 years. I've seen the world they try to navigate as student journalists. They faced obstacles in getting accurate information or even responses from the district or the government. They face pressure from their peers to not publish stories. They face scrutiny after a story is published and are accused of making up quotes even though they have recordings of the interviews to show quotes are accurately represented. And over my 23 years, they've navigated this minefield of obstacles, pressures, and threats with little guidance or help from the state. We can readily find standards and guidelines for how we teach civics, government, ethnic studies, science, and et cetera. We can find policies that protect kids from bullying, harassment, and discrimination. Those provide clarity for schools, students, and families as they try to navigate a increasingly complex world. Joining the 16 other states that have codified language protecting student expression in schools would provide the same clarity and guidance to both students and schools as they work to foster an environment that allows for the responsible practice of their civic rights and responsibilities. It's been my experience that when student journalists see issues in their schools, they want to talk about them. They want to foster a public discourse and make sure both sides are heard. In my 23 years, those issues have run the gamut of discussing the school lunches, of course, to illustrating the fight culture at our school and digging into real publicly available data to compare us to neighboring communities. The freedom to do that led one of my former students on the path to being the current investigative award-winning reporter at the Pittsburgh Gazette, and he's still only in his 20s. In one of the most powerful stories my students have published, they discussed rape culture and its face at our school through social media. They persevered in publishing the story through pressure from their peers who might have been culpable of perpetuating a rape culture, or parents of those peers and admin who didn't want the bad publicity such a story might bring. In the end, they were minutes away from uploading to the printer when our district administrator called with a stand down from the censorship and a clear, albeit belated, support of their First Amendment rights. And as we hope happens in a journalistically sound story, the only outcome of laying bare the rape culture at our school was that the specific instances we highlighted were called out by experts and those behaviors stopped. Schools should be celebrated for fostering student press rights, like my school eventually did in this instance. 
Our students should be celebrated for having the courage to write truthfully about issues amidst peer, faculty, and admin pressure. What was laid bare, though, is my students sat in a room with the school district's lawyer and fought for their First Amendment rights with their own representation, without their own representation, was that the state does not provide the necessary clarity and guardrails for students in schools. What would have been so very helpful was something to point to in state statute or policy that helped us support student voice and understand the limitations imposed upon them. I encourage you to move House File 4083 forward and join the 16 other states, including Iowa and North Dakota, and hopefully soon Wisconsin, in codifying and providing clarity for schools and student journalists as they exercise their most important civic right, their voices. Thank you again for the opportunity to be here tonight, and we look forward to the passage of this bill. Thank you. Jessica Wagner. And then after that, it will be Stella McHugh, if you can be ready. Good Please evening. Introduce yourself and proceed. I'm Jessica Wagner, and I am an English teacher at Owatonna High School for the last 22 years, and I have been the advisor of the student-run newspaper, OHS Magnet, for the last 10. Uh, I thank you tonight for letting me come and speak to you about New Voices and its potential impact for publications in our school. School newspapers are tasked with telling the stories of our community. More importantly, it provides an essential space where students can voice concerns to enlighten others and solve problems. Journalism is a powerful and necessary component to the health of every school. Students must be able to tell the stories that are important to them and are not just good press for the school district. This comes with great responsibility to journalism ethics. The Supreme Court decision on Hazelwood and Col versus Coleman sounds like it is making sure kids aren't writing false allegations poorly. However, it is essentially placing student journalists in the spot of being the school's public relations team or potentially fighting for every story if an administrator wants to review it before it is published. Thankfully, we've had a lot of good news to also broadcast. This current issue is that questioning a process is often seen as questioning an authority depending on the administration. A school newspaper is subject to budget cuts in an attempt to silence the articles under the disguise of cost savings. When we are silencing student reporters, oftentimes we are silencing the, the stories of the disenfranchised. This is played out in our newsroom. In the case of an editorial, my staff members who are also athletes were worried about losing their position if the activity director read it. After an accurate article about discipline, I was told to only shine a positive light. A few months later, when the school went to lockdown and law enforcement was called to handle the situation, I knew I would only be allowed to remain advisor if we did not report the story. Student journalists are not free of consequence from their speech but we should not be punished for reporting events that happen in our building and to our students. At the time, I had to decide if it was worth the future of student journalism at Owatonna High School, and if I was willing to be fired from my advisor role over it. Social media told the story. We were able to report the information with what we had nearly a month after the incident. Over the summer, the New York Times told the story of our students. While new administration has welcomed and celebrated OHS Magnet, which is evident by the fact that I'm here tonight, free press in the school shouldn't be dependent on a change in the principal or the superintendent's office. This is a problem in Minnesota as well as across the nation. I'm hopeful as I speak to you tonight for student journalists and for those hired to teach them to have the protection of the First Amendment right because a freedom is not, it is not a freedom if it is under review or you have to ask permission. Students become leaders when they are taught the power of responsibility that comes with reporting events and stories with integrity, without fear of censorship or review. These are the students who help solve problems and to polarize our culture. By modeling integrity in our publications, their readers learn media literacy and civic engagement. I believe by passing this legislation, all students will have a chance to be heard. I thank you for your time tonight. Thank you. Chair, <clears throat> Chair Pryor, can I just interject real quick? I just want to thank the students for being here tonight. It's a nice night. And I know they have work, probably homework to do when they get home. And um, having two Stillwater High School students here means a lot to me because I used to write for the Pony Express when I went to Stillwater. And I want to also thank Yoni um, Zachs for being here from Blake School. Why this bill does not cover um, private schools. He is here to support his public school um, <laughs> journalists and hopefully have this in statute so they can approach their school about this. So I just wanted to interject that here. Thank you. Thank you. And we. Second, the thanks, the thanks for um, being with us tonight. Uh, Stella McHugh, Pony Express Editor-in-Chief. Please introduce yourself and proceed. Hi, thank you. My name is Stella McHugh. I'm a senior at Stillwater Area High School, and I have been a journalist for the Pony Express for two years, and I'm currently Editor-in-Chief. 
The current Minnesota legislation under the 1988 Supreme Court case Hazelwood versus Kuhlmeyer states that school administration can censor school sponsored media when reasonably related to legitimate concerns. This vague standard allows administrators to engage in subjective and arbitrary censorship without an articulable pedagogical concern. Stories censored are often sensitive issues, such as stories critical of administration or covering topics such as the LGBTQ plus community. Returning Minnesota to the previous Tinker standards will allow students full First Amendment rights while still maintaining lawful oversight of students and preventing libelous material from being published. My team of EICs recently wrote an article about racial tensions within our school, an issue that was sensitive but necessary to cover. We were hesitant to write the story due to the harsh reality that it would bring to our staff the same staff that had the ability to censor the story. We spent weeks arguing over every sentence, every word, wondering if it would be too controversial to publish and if it would be censored. Without more protection at the state level, redefining these case precedents and supporting student press, then students will continue to be fearful of using school-sponsored media to discuss important issues because they fear that they will be censored. This fear is also known as the chilling effect or putting a chill on students' expression and willingness to cover sensitive topics effectively limiting students' voices. This goes against the decision in Tinker that students don't shed their constitutional rights at the schoolhouse gate. We need legislation that will allow us to honestly inform and educate the community on things that matter, free from fear and unjust censorship. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, I have um, Bella Lapos, and after that, Yoni Zaks. Hello, um, thank you. My name is Belle Lapis. I'm a senior at Stillwater Area High School and have been a part of our school publication, The Pony Express, for two years. I'm now an editor-in-chief helping to oversee the program. Freedom of expression through school-sponsored media is a fundamental principle granted by the First Amendment of the Constitution. As an editor-in-chief and student leader, my job is to decide what stories our journalists write and publish. Because of the sphere of censorship instilled by the court case Hazelwood versus <laughs> Kuhlmeyer, Students cannot truly express their opinions and write articles reflecting their passions and conversations happening within the community. Critical thinking and open conversations are often censored out of fear. Recently, our publication wrote a series of articles reflecting upon concerns of racial violence and changes in our community that students expressed. To publish these articles, we felt we had to put the school into a good light to ensure that we could reflect opinions without censorship. This ultimately silenced many of the interviewed students. Unfortunately, many schools in the state haven't been lucky enough to publish stories deemed too controversial, often leading to full censorship of the story and even shutting down publications. With this bill, the Tinker Standard is restored for all students. It will serve as a way for students to express their opinions while still allowing st school officials to stop publication of student media in certain cases. From our experience, most students are in journalism to express themselves and give a voice to the student body and experiences. It is a platform for concerns, stories, and perspectives to be acknowledged. To date, the Student Press Law Center is aware of no reported court decision where a school district has been held liable for material published by its high school student media in the 16 states with this legislation. The role of a student publication is to express legitimate information and to inform and educate the community about things that matter. This bill will protect us in doing so. Thank you. Thank you. Tony Sachs, please introduce yourself and proceed. And then I have Dr. Terrence Morrow. Uh, good evening. Um, my name is Yoni Zachs. Um, I am a junior at the Blake School in Minneapolis, and I have been on our newspaper. This, I've worked on our newspaper, The Spectrum, for three years, and I am currently a managing editor. Student press freedoms are extremely important to me. School newspapers have given me and thousands of others the opportunity to have our voices heard and to tell the stories that need to be told. We have a responsibility to always be honest and always tell stories. By expanding these student press protections, students will be able to provide a forum for student opinions and cover the issues that really need to be addressed. There have been times in the past when our school has collectively experienced issues that need to be addressed. Two years ago, when our school had an assembly that left a large majority of the student body uncomfortable, our editorial staff put the article on the front page. This gave students the opportunity to voice their concerns and to the administration without the fear of repercussions. As a staff writer at the time, I was impressed by the in-depth critiques of the administration and the fact that they were able to publish this article in the first place. 
However, I was also concerned about repercussions from the administrators named in the article. At the time of reading it, I vividly remember thinking, this is a great article, but what's going to happen to the writer? And then at the end of October, when the other news editors and I felt like the community wasn't talking about the Israel Hamas war. And this created an environment where students were afraid of repercussions for what they would say in class. We decided as a staff that the best way to cover the war was to ask community members how they thought we should discuss the conflict. <coughs> as a newspaper, we felt a responsibility to adhere to our mission statement and inform our readers and provide a forum for opinions. After publishing that piece, the editorial staff decided to move forward with covering the war by doing it in depth spread. We published a timeline, a list of resources, a survey, a Q&A, more student perspectives, and an article questioning how the student body had talked about this conflict. Before publishing this, I was incredibly anxious as I had played a large role in the creation of this, of this page, even coming up with the idea for it, and I was afraid that there would be repercussions for giving the space for students to share their opinions, not just from the administration, but also from other students. We believe that students should have a space to have their voices heard and to formulate perspectives without fear of repercussions and where adults cannot have that space. Although this bill does not apply to me personally as a private school student, my hope is that if this bill is passed, private schools will follow, such as Blake will follow suit. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. And finally, we have a public testifier, Dr. Terrence Barrow. Thank you, Madam Chair. Terry Morrow, Policy and Legal Services Director, Minnesota School Boards Association, recognizing I'm following some very difficult acts. You put me under pressure here. But I would like to say thank you, Representative. Uh, we have had a chance to talk about this bill. And I come here today to uh, agree with the amendments that have been made to the bill. One concerned advertising. In the original bill, the school would have had to allow any advertising that the students chose. And we have advertising policies concerning materials that are unlawful for minors, for example. So I thank you for adding that. We can't run those ads. Secondly, uh, and I really appreciate the discussion of subdivision three on page two, starting at line 2.20. In the Senate this morning, we were able to, or earlier this afternoon, we were able to clarify that the unprotected expression uh, could be overseen by, uh, for example, the, the student media supervisor on line 2.2. We wanted to clarify that if there was an article that was defamatory, that did constitute an unwarranted invasion of privacy, that the school would be able to step in, hopefully in a teaching, teachable moment way, but nonetheless, to ensure that our policies or the law weren't violated by a publication. And with that, um, I have nothing further to add to this bill this time, other than to say thank you for working with us on this bill. Thank you. And finally, I have Roger Arneson, Minnesota Association of Secondary School Principals. Madam Chair and members, my name is Roger Ernst and I represent the Elementary and Secondary Principal Association. El Secondary Principals here. Um, I want to first off uh, say that we deeply appreciate um, uh, Chair Joachim's uh, amendment to the bill that, that cured a major problem that we have and, and I know that that wasn't easy for her um, to do that um, and that, that was a very good thing for us. We want to say a couple things just to be on the record about this uh, for school principals. Um, you heard a lot about um, Tinker versus Des Moines and, and the Hazelwood case. But the Hazelwood case is why we're here talking about this. Hazelwood occurred in 1983. It actually was a 1988 U.S. Supreme Court case. But in that, student journalists did an article about high school girls who were pregnant and how they navigated high school being pregnant. The, the journalists had promised the students confidentiality. The principal reviewed the article and said, I can tell who these kids are. So we're going to pull this article to protect those kids. That's what Hazelwood was about. Those, the newspaper kids sued and said, we have a First Amendment right to print this. And the US Supreme Court said, actually, no, you don't. If the school district is the, quote, publisher of that paper, and it's being run as a class, then the school can say, there are some things that don't go in the paper. Now, you've heard from very talented students, very compelling testimony. 
um, we would submit to you as a school principals that school newspapers are working quite well in Minnesota and have done so for a long time. If you Googled the Eden Prairie paper, if you Googled the Hopkins paper, you would see that they have controversial articles, they do the in-depth work, um, and that they're good learning places for students. But principals will never come in here and tell you that we think supervision is unnecessary. We always think supervision is necessary. We just can't get away with that. And what we want to do with, without that, and what we want to do is that we like to say, kids do better with some supervision um, and, and give them the opportunity to do better. So I think that um, um, we know that Sherry Joachim's um, heart is in the right place and supporting these people. Um, we frankly are rarely on the other side of the coin with her. It is uncomfortable to be in that position here today. I don't like it. Um, but I do have to come up and say that for the folks. So we appreciate working with her, and um, Madam Chair, appreciate working with the committee. So thank you very much. Thank you. All right, having no more testifiers, oh, we'll, we'll, we'll have a discussion. <laughs> yes. No, thank you, Madam Chair, and I'm just disappointed that Mr. Aronson never said uh, that uh, I regret being on the opposite side of Representative Erdahl. <laughs> There were a couple of issues over the years, but uh, <laughs> we've generally reached accommodations. Uh, you know, I was a school newspaper reporter back, they actually did have typewriters and things uh, when I was there. And uh, in, our, our, in our system in Litchfield High School, look for the Dragon News, uh, our supervisor was, you know, the, the teacher in charge of the journalism class. And uh, in terms of censorship, worked very well. He would just come by, read my articles, and say, you can't do that. Um, he was generally right, so I didn't question him very much. But, uh, you know, I, I, I think that's probably the way it still works across Minnesota, that uh, writers, uh, student writers, uh, the, their advisor, their uh, journalism teacher, whatever, uh, is the first censor, essentially. And that, I think, probably works pretty well. If they're, uh, but I'm generally, you know, in agreement with the, the basis of this bill, as far as, as how it is intended to work, uh, I think you know, freedom of speech is an important quality. There should be some guardrails, and I'm glad to see that through the amendments uh, there are some of those being placed. But uh, you know, generally over the years, the, the system, uh, I think, has worked fairly well, and I look forward to seeing how this shakes out. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Feist. <laughs> thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just wanted to thank uh, Representative Joachim for bringing this bill. Um, as former board member of the ACLU of Minnesota for a while um, and a big fan of Tinker v. Des Moines, um, any bill that, that inspires us to quote that um, great quote about um, our constitutional rights not ending at the schoolhouse gate is an important um, bill for us to advance. Um, so um, thank you so much for this really important free speech bill. And thanks to the students. Representative Keeler. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Chair Joachim, for this. I do really think it's important um, for students to be able to share what's happening in their perspective. But mainly, I just wanted to say thank you to the students that came. Um, you were w well prepared. You did a great job. And I think when we have our next generation stand up for something that they want to see, it's important that us as adults at this table really listen to that. So thank you for taking the time. I'm sure nobody wants to be here. Well, whatever time it is on whatever day it is right now, right? But like, thank you for coming. Thank you for being a part of this. Thank you for including the youth in this work. Representative Baker. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> thank you, Chair Joachim. And, and I would echo what Rep Keeler talked about. Students, you did a fantastic job. I would say you did a much better job than the adults that testified, but so. <laughs> um, I might be a little biased there, though. So. Um, and, and I think just a couple comments. So the completely agree that, that we need to teach kids how to have 
dialogue with people that are that have a different perspective than us. So I think it's phenomenal, and the, the more we do that, the better off we're going to be. Because frankly, um, we don't do that well as adults. And and, and I think Chair Joachim talked about it in a, you know, with these and, you know, trying to get tweets and likes, um, you know, having constructive dialogue doesn't, doesn't play into that well. And, you know, we talked about Tinker, we talked about Hazelwood, so, so I won't go into that. But I, I think just from a principal lens and from an, really an educator lens, one of the things that there, there's always this tension of trying to teach kids how to have constructive dialogue and, and teach them how to kind of push the envelope while also not putting them in a situation where they're going to make a mistake that could really impact them for a long time. So I had um, my son was showing me some, some bar stool pages. For those of you that don't know, uh, <laughs> uh, Representative <coughs> Frazier knows where I'm going with this. There are some things that are said on some of these pages online that are highly inappropriate, but to a high school kid, very funny. Yes. And then you fast forward that out to when that child is applying for a job. It can have, have damaging effects for that student. So I think that's the tension that principals are trying to, to navigate, is, is how do I teach these kids without um, you know, stifling their First Amendment rights, which we don't want to do that, but also not setting them up for failure long term. So um, with that, I, I think you know, we, we just need to continue to work together and, and partner with everyone involved to, to how do we balance that tension. Thank you, Representative Bakeford. Okay, Representative Bennett. Thanks, Madam Chair. And Chair Yuakim, what a great conversation. This is, this is good. And thank you to the students. They're all, I think, a lot behind me, but I, I loved hearing that passion and the discussion. Uh, and I, I think all the comments are excellent. Um, all around this table. And I guess I'll just express my one concern, which would be very similar to Representative Bakeberg, is in the end, and I taught first grade, so I taught the other end of the spectrum. We didn't have student newspapers in first grade. But um, in the end, they are still children, adolescents with developing brains. And we have to be very careful to allow freedom, but also within constraint. And so one, I guess the one thing I would like to see in this bill, and it probably defeats the purpose, but there should be some kind of a final veto allowed to protect things like Rep. Baker said, where you get something online, social media is forever now, and uh, the internet that would really harm a student in the future. And so I just think it needs a little more discussion in that area. Um, we have, we're dealing with developing brains that need guidance. We, we do a lot of guidance. We, we don't let young people join the military or, or get married or, or own a gun or, or even get a tattoo because we know those brains are not um, fully developed, especially in that judgment area. And so I do believe a school, as the publisher, as was mentioned, should have a final veto power. It should be rare because I do think First Amendment's important for our kids. I don't know if that could be worked in without ruining your whole bill, Rep. Joachim, but just my thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. Closing remarks, Chair Joachim. Um, thank you, uh, Chair Pryor, and I do agree with everybody at this table. Um, and they are growing brains. In fact, our brains are growing until we're 26. Um, you're so it's important to have those teachable moments. We all know that, those of us who are parents in the room as well. But those teachable moments don't need to ha they need to happen in a safe environment with trained teachers, and that's what this bill does. And once again, to subdivision three, the unprotected expression, the district does have veto power over that. And kids need to practice this in that safe environment. They need to be able to stretch their wings so they're ready to fly when they <coughs> leave high school because the, you know, the light just doesn't turn on when they're 18 and they're off on their own. So this bill does have those protections. And I just, I want to thank Representative Erdahl. You were out of the room when I thanked you earlier um, for supporting this bill and working with me on it as well. 
Um, I also want to thank, and I would be remiss if I didn't thank the tutelage of my journalism teacher, who at times did tell me, yeah, no, you can't do that. <laughs> um, Bev Skoglund, uh, who taught us those good journalistic standards. And we had a literary magazine, a newspaper, and she was brave enough to have us let a video yearbook <laughs> went back when we still had video, um, if you guys even know what that is. But no, I think it's very important to have this because not all administration might be understanding those journalistic standards in the First Amendment. Um, and there has been a, a, you know, a lot of discussion about Hayes Wood and Tinker. Um, the ex, uh, unprotected expression that you're seeing in Tinker um, that we put in this bill, Hazelwood went way beyond that when they did their ruling. Um, they went way beyond looking at that unwarranted invasion of privacy because under Tinker, the district would have been able, they, were, they would have been able to censor if that was too identifiable for um, the student and they still can now. So you have that on line 2.24, constitutes an unwarranted invasion of privacy. We talk a lot about data in this committee and it's kind of aggregated or disaggregated, so that's in here. So I'll go to my final comments then. Um, over the years, a few cases regarding the First Amendment rights of students have gone all the way to the Supreme Court. And we've mentioned two of the major notable cases tonight, Tinker v. Des Moines and Hayeswood v. Kuhlmeyer. In 1969, Tinker v. Des Moines dealt with students having the right to wear armbands in schools to protect the Vietnam War. In that case, the rights of students were upheld. In 1988, Hazelwood v. Kuhlmeyer dealt with the censorship of two articles in a student newspaper. This case overturned the First Amendment protection of students. Hazelwood went way beyond Tinker and way beyond um, what I would say would be good journalistic standards or the students having the First, um, First Amendment rights, but that's the law we live under today is Hazelwood. And don't take it from me, you can learn a lot from reading court opinions. I have, I've reread them again because it had been a while. Um, you can read a lot from reading both the supporting and the dissenting opinions. And it's an interesting look at a period of time and what period of time that was. Tinker was under a liberal court. Hazelwood was under a conservative court. Um, there are a few things that struck me when I read the dissenting opinion of Justice William Brennan in Hazelwood v. Kuhlmeyer in 1988. Justice Brennan stated that a journalism class is a forum established to give students an opportunity to express their views while gaining appreciation of their rights and responsibilities under the First Amendment to the United States Constitution. I think as adults, we have to remember that too, that we have a responsibility when we choose the words we choose. He also restated from Brown versus Board of Education that public education serves a vital national interest in preparing the nation's youth for life in our increasingly complex society and for duties of citizenship in our democratic republic. Public. Now this was 1988. Can you imagine what uh, Justice Brennan would think of 2023? <laughs> and that um, he also said that the public school conveys to our young the information and tools required not merely to survive in, but to contribute to a civilized society. In his dissenting opinion, Justice Brennan was clearly concerned that the Hazelwood verdict would stifle student expression and growth. He recognized what many of us in this room know, that the schools are incubators for our future leaders. It is where they gain the skills to be critical thinkers and grow into adults who can contribute to our civilized society. In Tinker v. Des Moines, the Supreme Court struck a balance. They held that official censorship of student expression is unconstitutional unless the speech materially disrupts classwork or involves substantial disorder or invasion of the rights of others. Hazelwood disrupted that balance, and we desperately need to find that balance again. This bill, House File 4083, begins to write the scales. It will allow our students the freedom to learn, grow, and set their thoughts to flight. So members, I would appreciate your support. Thank you, thank you. And with that, um, Representative Joachim renews her motion to re-refer House File 4083 as amended to the General Register. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? No. The motion carries and House File 4083, as amended, is on its way to the floor. Thank you. All right. Representative Frazier. Mm. House file 4373. <laughs> and thank you again. 
those that came today to testify. We appreciated hearing from you directly. And there's another interesting bill coming up. <laughs> All of our bills. Are yes. <laughs> All right, our next bill for consideration is House File 4373. And members, it's our intention to re-refer this bill to the Judiciary, Finance, and Civil Law Committee for further consideration. Uh, Representative Frazier, uh, would you please move House File 4373 before the committee to be re-referred? That is my motion, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you. All right, and I believe you also have a DE2 amendment, which, um, uh, which means that basically we should just be talking about the DE2 amendment. And so let's move the DE2 amendment before us. Um, any discussion of the DE2? All right. Um, I'm, that's your motion then to move the DE2 before us. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. So now we have the bill before us with the DE2 added. Um, please begin your presentation. Thank you, thank you, Madam Chair, uh, members, um, folks in the audience, thanks for being here as we earn this late hour of the evening. I know we're all probably ready to get home at some point, but there's one more bill after this, so, but I will be as concise as possible. Uh, this, this bill really is about, we have this phenomenon now that is kind of sweeping across the country where we're seeing groups um, uh, or individuals supported by groups that have an agenda to remove certain books out of our libraries, public libraries, school libraries, and you know, I don't have a, I don't have an issue with um, taking a look at materials and determining whether or not those materials are pro age appropriate or just inappropriate for our for our students. What I have concern with, and what this bill seeks to address, is the particular books based on particular authors, um, their their background, their lived experience, or their political ideology are being targeted, and that is that is my concern. It kind of goes back to this First Amendment. Um, expression that we've talked to in the with these prior bill presentations I am concerned about that and this bill looks to address that and I will say the conversation um, started in the interim the conversation will continue I don't believe that the bill as it is today uh, with the DE amendment will be the final bill because I will continue to have conversations with in individuals and associations that have a stake in what we're doing here um, but I do we believe we need to do something to have some uniformity um, across the state, so it's very clear about what the process will be in terms of how we uh, choose the material that's in our libraries and then how we take a look to reconsider those materials to determine if they are appropriate or not for our students. So that is what this bill seeks to do. Um, it has to go to judiciary because there is a private right of action um, and they're still working on that as well. We want to make sure that it is tailored to address what what I'm, what I'm trying to address here. And what I'm trying to address with the private right of action is to deter um, outside groups from coming in and funding um, these attempts to remove, restrict, or ban books um, based on particular ideology or political uh, affiliation um, or cultural um, uh, um, perspectives. I wanna make sure that we have something there as a deterrent for that. And the reason being is because it is a cost. It is a monetary financial cost to our districts, to our libraries, when these, uh, when these requests are made. And in some cases, they are made multiple times, um, and, and you, those have a cost, and they quickly add up to the dollars that are being spent on these. And in some cases, uh, folks bringing these, bring these requests, they know that the book may not specifically be inappropriate, but it is something that they don't like, the ideology or the author of the books political affiliation or cultural or demographic backgrounds. So we wanna have a mechanism in there to address that um, when possible. So that is, that is what the bill um, seeks to do. I know that we have multiple testifiers, so I will, I will yield and allow the testifiers to um, state their case. Great, thank you. First on my list is Carlton Laster, uh, out front Minnesota, and after that, Kendra Redman, if you can be ready. Thank you for joining us this evening. Please introduce yourself and begin. Thank you, and sorry for my attire. I'm just coming from a youth summit all day. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Chair Pryor and committee members. My name is Carlton Laster, and I'm the Director of Policy and Organizing for Outfront Minnesota, the state's largest LGBTQ plus 
advocacy organization. In this role, I am privileged to advocate and push for policies that benefit Minnesota's LGBTQ plus community and address disparities. Today, I am speaking in favor of House File 4373, the book ban prohibition. As a queer black man, I can tell you how hard it is to see rep how hard it is to see representation based on my own personal experience. As a writer and poet, I can tell you that I write about the intersections of race, culture, sexuality, and politics, the things that shape who I am and what I do. Reading and writing literature has always provided an escape for me. It allowed me to imagine a better life. It allowed me to communicate my hard feelings and truths to my family and friends, and it allowed me to come out to my family. My writing is aimed to be an entry point for BIPOC peoples and those who are typically disengaged or do not see themselves in poetry. That is why I find challenges to books in Bloomington, Lakeville, Annandale, and other communities in Minnesota so injur injurious, not only because the BIPOC and LGBTQ communities there, uh, to, not only to the BIPOC and LGBTQ communities there, but also to the residents at large. When queer and BIPOC students read Audre Lorde, Lorraine Hansberry, Langston Hughes, County Cullen, Nikki Giovanni, James Baldwin, George C. Wolf, and Jacqueline Woodson, they're able to see themselves fully in our history and text. All students should have that same opportunity and the chance to engage with the complexities of our diverse human experience. When books are removed from libraries, it harms everyone and it closes opportunities to foster curiosity and healthy conversation. I respectfully ask that the committee votes to approve House File 4373, and I thank Rep. Frazier for their leadership on this initiative. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have Kendra Redmond, and after that, Jay Belcito. And if you can, Kendra Jack, um, Redmond, if you can identify yourself, your organization, and begin with your testimony. Good evening. Thank you to the committee and to Chair Pryor for the opportunity to testify. My name is Kendra Redmond and my pronouns are she, her. I'm a Bloomington resident with three kids in public school district 271. I'm testifying in support of HF 4373. Last fall, a group petitioned our school board to immediately and permanently remove 28 titles from our K-12 public school libraries. Their list contained primarily books featuring or written by members of the LGBTQ plus community and people of color. This set off alarm bells for many parents. Public and school libraries exist to serve their richly diverse communities, not the personal beliefs of some. We have been fighting the petition and its harmful rhetoric for more than seven months now. Perhaps our most important efforts have been supporting the amazingly courageous students speaking out against the proposed ban at great personal risk and being a voice for those students unable to do so. At public school board listening sessions, we've heard from students and alums that the library was quite literally a lifeline, the first pla place they saw themselves reflected and realized that they were not alone. We've heard students defend their right to access books with characters who mirrored their identities, situations relevant to their lives, and topics that are difficult but necessary to talk about in their world. We've heard from high school students who responded to the libraries being, and I quote, under siege by forming a large and active Bloomington Freedom to Read Club. We've heard middle and elementary school students, some barely old enough to stay home alone, tell the school board that they benefit from reading about characters like themselves. And reading about people who are different can help us better understand each other, they told us. Minnesota communities and our children should not have to fight for access to books. As adults, we must show our students that they matter, that we will protect their safety, inclusion, and education. We must ensure their access to books deemed appropriate by librarians, <coughs> media content specialists, and educators. They are looking to us to act. I urge you to support this bill and our freedom to read in Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, Jay Belisito, um, Gender Justice, and after that, uh, Dr. Terrence Smurr again. <laughs> if you can identify yourself and begin. Hi, thanks for having me. Um, my name is Jay Belcito. Um, 
I'm with Gender Justice. Um, it's a legal and political advocacy organization dedicated to advancing gender equity through the law. Um, I'm writing, or I'm here to support Representative Frazier's bill HF 4737, 4373, prohibiting book banning in public and school libraries across the country and in Minnesota. There are efforts to ban books that provide accurate lessons about the role of race, gender, and civil rights in America. Most of us believe that students should have the freedom to read books that explain our world and help them to become the best versions of their authentic selves. Books are tools for understanding complex issues and challenging issues, and targeting books with LGBTQ inclusion and with, cens with censorship is an attempt to erase trans and LGBTQ people from public life. These efforts promote discrimination and send a harmful message to youth that being LGBTQ is wrong. Reading is a foundational skill and it's critical to future learning and exercising our democratic freedoms. I'm also here as um, a parent and a former educator in Minneapolis Public Schools. My oldest just graduated from Patrick Henry on the north side last year. All of my children go to Minneapolis Public Schools. Um, and this is just a, it's very um, urgent that we encourage our children to continue to access these resources and that our children have um, literature and media that reflects their identities from their ethnicity to their sexual orientation to their gender orientation. Um, I can attest that unfortunately children are not um, rushing to, uh, to the library to check out books. It's actually quite a push, a pull sometimes to try to get them to um, find books that interest them and get them in the library more. So definitely this is something that can really help encourage um, a, a really necessary skill. So thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you for testifying. All right. Chair Pryor, members of the committee, my name is Terry Moore. I'm director of legal and policy services for the Minnesota School Boards Association. I did not lose my job after my last testimony. Uh, I just want to offer a little guidance and some experience from the MSBA perspective. I would say that library book policy was the number one request of our 331 school districts throughout the state of Minnesota within the last two years. Please help us, help us set up procedures, help us set up approaches. And Representative Frazier and I, we've had chances to talk about that and I'm grateful for that. I will tell you what our model policy does. It does two things. It talks about selection of books and reconsideration of books. Selection of books, the school board can set up criteria for uh, guiding the selection committee on what books to put in which library. The key word, and thank you, Representative Frazier, is appropriate. Books should be appropriate to the school that they serve. Elementary books and high school books in two separate libraries serve two different audiences with two different levels of appropriateness. So we deal with selection. Then we deal with reconsideration. I would like to reiterate that under our model policy, any parent, any time, can uh, direct the school library to not allow their child to check out certain books. That is very similar to what we do in Minnesota law for instructional materials. Beyond that, we set up a reconsideration process by which any member of the school community, doesn't have to be in the school, can be a resident, taxpayer, whomever, can request reconsideration of a book, a committee is set up, and the school district can choose what appeals processes it has. With that said, Representative Frazier and I have had a chance to talk. We've also talked with the Minnesota Department of Education, uh, and I've told you that as well, that we're just trying to work in a way that the process is good and that we focus on appropriate books and we're not put in a position where inappropriate books end up on our school bookshelves. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. Right, and finally we have from the Department of Education, Legislative Coordinator, Megan Rola. If you can identify yourself and begin with your presentation. Madam Chair and committee members, my name is Megan Ariola. I'm the legislative coordinator at the Minnesota Department of Education. Thank you for allowing me some time to speak to the committee about the value that public and school libraries provide our state and why we believe that protecting access to information is so crucial for this day and age. 
As we presented to this committee last month, the governor's education policy bill contains language that would ensure access to library materials free from politics. Since we presented the original language in committee, MDE has been engaged with a number of interested parties, including the school board association, librarians, and other groups to hear feedback, concerns, and language recommendations. Some prefer the language before us today. Some prefer the governor's original language, but overall, we're working toward final language to meet the intent that we all share. The biggest takeaway from these meetings is that there's overwhelming support for protecting Minnesotans' access to information at their public libraries. I'd like to thank Representative Fraser for being a partner in this endeavor, and we're committed to continue these discussions around what final language looks like, hear creative and constructive feedback, and develop the best language that protects the invaluable contributions that our public libraries provide our state. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Having no more testifiers, we will move to member discussion. Representative Keeler, I saw you first. Oh, I, wasn't. I was looking at the book guy over there. You don't oh, want to uh, go and talk about how great books are at all. Well, I could list my books, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> this is your chance. Okay, I'll, thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Representative Frazier, for bringing this. I, I do want to take a, a, just a little bit of time to talk about books and what that really means to people like me, like my kids, like the kids I've worked with. So um, when I was a liaison, I was a big part of a group that met every summer with middle school kids around um, mirrors, windows, and sliding glass doors and how what we read really impacts who we are. As an indigenous queer person, um, I say in a lot of spaces, like in the classroom, I never saw teachers who look like me. And I have four degrees. Um, I definitely never saw who I was or my family structure in any books that I read. Um, and, and we know that when it comes to literacy, you know, like kids who have more than 20 books in their home growing up tend to go to school for almost three years on average longer because they have books. But I have a seven-year-old, and if any of you guys work with kids, like kids have to be engaged in what they're reading. They have to like what they read. Like we read about dinosaurs and dragons, but we also read about people who look like us. When my son read, um, there's a book that's around Sharice Davis, and it's Sharice's Big Voice, and it talks about being a Native American woman running for the legislature. And when my son read that, the first thing he said was like, look, mom, that's you because he could see his family, who he was in a book, and that was new to him. My older son never had that either. The concerning part of what books end up on this list, um, out of the 100 banned books, one of the top books that's banned um, is The Absolute True Diary of a Part-Time Indian um, by Sherman Alexi, which I let my middle schoolers read all the time. It's actually a real life story about our pain, our honest, true struggle that we go through, um, it's written from a perspective that's real. It gets banned because it's too graphic and there's like issues that are real to who we are and we need to be able to connect with that. We talk a lot about mental health, we talk a lot about life expectancy, we talk a lot about making healthy choices, but when we can't read books that express or show who we are, who our family structures are, who the makeup of who we believe we are from a cultural component, it really hinders our literacy. And I've heard this group specifically talk about how important literacy is and getting all of our kids to levels. If you look at the kids in the breakdown, we've looked at the, at the data enough to show it's kids who look like me and my kids who really struggle with literacy and long-term reading. And so to start banning books that reflect or show this mirror of who we are only impacts our literacy in a negative way long-term. And so it's more than just which books we can read. It's really about showing our next generations that they belong in these spaces, that they can be authors, that they can share stories about the realities of who we are. Um, and I believe that that's really, really, really important. And so thank you for bringing this bill. Thank you for allowing us to have the conversation. Thank you, MDE, for getting all of the stakeholders involved to have honest conversations about this. Um, and I do believe we, we want to protect the voices of our future generations and making sure that we're visible. I've said it in a lot of spaces that representation really matters and in our books it does. Your families matter just as much as my families matter um, and we deserve to see that across the board. So thank you. Representative Mueller. Thank you, Chair. And I just, I, I'm gonna, thank you, thank you Representative Frazier. Um, as a teacher for a long, long time, I'm listening to many of the things that are here that I've been hearing and I taught many of these books. I know I know what we're talking about. But I want to pivot because I believe that as we're looking at what we have 
we have, uh, what we're asking our schools to do and what we as a committee are to do, which is to make sure that our kiddos are learning. I want us to, to ground this discussion in the fact that 49% of our students can't read at grade level. I want us to ground our discussion that 47% of our third graders cannot read at grade level. And I want us to understand that while we're talking about this, every book is banned for a child that doesn't know how to read. They can't read. It doesn't matter what book you put in front of their face. Every book is banned for a kiddo that cannot read. And that's what we should be focusing on right now. That's what we should be doing. We started with the READ Act, and that's great. But that's what we should be focusing on because our schools already tell us they still need time to do that. And so I want us to really think about what our priorities are because I heard from the testifier. Where, did, where, where is my testifier? I keep all their notes. Um, that reading is a foundational skill that protects our future democracy. That was what one of our testifiers said. Got to know how to read. In the last 10 years, we've had a failing system of what's happening here, and especially in the last four years where we've seen a, where was my notes here, 16% drop of students who are failing proficiency tests. We need to focus our priorities and address the fact that we need to make sure our kiddos know how to read. Focus on the science of reading and really prioritize that and ground ourselves in those things before we take up something like this. Thank you, Representative Frazier. Thank you, Chair Pryor. Representative Bennett. Thank you, Madam Chair. Quiet bunch today, or this evening. We're all tired, right? I don't know if I could say it much better, Rep. Mueller. Thank you. I, um, I loved read. I, first of all, I love libraries. I love books. One of my favorite parts of teaching was reading to my kids, my students. I loved it. And uh, one of my favorite places to be is a library. I love libraries and books. But I, when I was a kid, I did terrible in school. If you saw my grade school uh, grades, not good. C's, D's, not until about ninth grade. But one thing I could do was read, and I think that was my saving grace. And so that's, again, what I want to focus on, as Rep. Mueller said. We have half of our kids in our state that can't read. It doesn't matter if it's an inappropriate or appropriate book, a banned book or an unbanned book. If you can't read it, it's not going to do you any good. You can't enjoy it. You can't learn about your culture. You can't learn about history or just enjoy a great story. So I'm going to encourage us to focus on literacy skills and get down to these basics that we really need to so we can get our students up to level. Thanks. Um, I think we'll go to closing comments. Representative Frazier. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I, I do appreciate the uh, conversation, although a little muted, <laughs> unexpectedly so. Um, but I appreciate that. And I, and I will I, I will hold to what I said earlier. I will continue to have conversations. So if anybody has any questions, please reach out to me and we can talk about this as we continue to move this bill. You know, I, I, I understand the disparities that we have in this state. Um, you know, people, kids that look like me fall within those disparities quite frequently when it comes to the educational outcomes um, and particularly the, the reading um, stats that you just um, threw out there. But, you know, it doesn't mean that we can't prioritize multiple things at once. We're tasked with doing that every single day that we come in here when we work on multiple bills. I've got bills in, in almost every setting, every committee within this uh, legislature. And many of them are priorities. I don't say that I won't, uh, that I will decline to do one because one is more important. Uh, at the end of the day, there's an intersection, a cross section between these priorities that require us to do more than one thing, require us to walk and chew gum at the same time. This is one of those priorities. So we have to, with fidelity, stick to it to ensure that our kids have access to learning materials that will provide them with 
um, experiences that will help them as they go out into the world. Well, they're experiencing the world now, actually. I just, I just, let me take a step back. They're experiencing, experiencing the world now. And if we don't continue to create opportunities so they can learn about the world, where they are, that was, that was the most important thing for me about having the opportunity to have access to reading materials. It took me on trips around the world in my small bungalow house on the south side of Chicago. It took me away from that place. No matter what was happening outside, I read those books, opened those books, and I was gone from all the negative things for hours on end. That is what we want to ensure that our kids, the next generation, continue to have. That's why this bill is important. That's why reading is fundamental. It's also important that we make sure they can read. But this bill is just as important because it's important that they have access to those materials. So I'll close with that. There's more work to be done, and we'll do that work. We'll keep having the conversations. And I thank you all for the conversation. I'm looking forward to more. All right. And with that, Representative Frazier renews his motion to re-refer House File 4373 as amended to the Judiciary, Finance, and Civil Law Committee. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? No. no. The motion carries, and House File 4373, as amended, is on its way. Thank you, Representative Frazier. Thank you for the discussion tonight, members. And I'll do that. Okay. All right. And finally this evening, um, we will uh, hear from Representative Burt, House File 3546. And so it is our intent um, to lay House File 3546 over uh, for possible inclusion in a policy bill um, for after further consideration. And I know that, um, um, Representative Berg, that you do have an A1 amendment and that you had also considered another amendment um, that you had wanted to um, present as the bill instead, but there had not been enough time to get that posted. Um, and so I think maybe I'll let you describe um, the A1 amendment and then also the amendment that you would like to, that it will not be before us, um, but that is one that you're considering for this bill. So Representative Berg. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair, that's correct. So uh, the A1 amendment is just striking lines 1.18 um, and 1.19. Um, oh, and so that's what the A1 will do. We, we want to remove that language, get the bill in the order we prefer. And then, um, so you're right, we didn't have time to really um, finesse the language on this, this uh, amendment that we will maybe update next week, I believe. Um, and it, it will just um, kind of update the language of 1.15 and 1.16 to say updated curriculum that includes helping students abstain from sex. That, that'll just be the new verbiage once that amendment language gets put on. Okay, and I, I apologize also, I did not we did not make the motion to bring the bill before us as we start to discuss it. And so, uh, Representative Berg, would you like to make the motion to uh, bring House File, your House File 3546 before the committee to lay it over for possible consideration? Thank you, Madam Chair. That is my motion. All right. And we will now, ad um, after that discussion, we'll adopt the A1 amendment. Um, so the bill before us will have include the A1 amendment. Um, any discussion of the A1 amendment? Thank you. Um, all in favor of the A1 amendment, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. The A1 amendment is before us. All right. Um, all right. All right. So thank you, uh, Representative Berg. Um, please present your bill. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. This is a relatively simple but really important bill. Um, what this will do is update the current sexually transmitted infections, including uh, language, including human immune deficiency virus, or HIV, and human papillomavirus, HPV. Uh, we all want young people here in Minnesota to have access to the information that they need to grow up safe, healthy, and confident. With SDIs on the rise in Minnesota, we need to ensure all young people get scientifically and medically accurate information to make healthy decisions. Schools have been required to teach HIV education for 35 years and STI education for 24 years. 
STIs are often very stigmatized, yet most are treatable and all are preventable with knowledge about safe sex. This bill updates the statute to ensure that all Minnesotans get the information they need to protect themselves and their communities against STIs now and in the future. So the three main things this bill does. First, the bill changes all references to technically accurate to scientifically and medically accurate. This ensures that the information will be of the highest standards. This language is similar to what we see in other statutes. Uh, second, uh, as we mentioned, um, pr prior to me starting these remarks, um, that we're still working on the language around abstaining from sexual activity, uh, and we'll have that amendment next week. Um, the best STI education is an emphasis on the facts, and the reality is that by the age of 30, 93% of people have had premarital sex. Uh, also, uh, these show how important STI and STD education continues to be for high school students. So with that, I think that I have a testifier here. All right. Um, I have on my list Dr. Elizabeth Bard Henke, um, OBGYN, Abbott Northwestern Hospital. Thank you for being with us this evening, and we hope this was not as inconvenient as it probably was. <laughs> uh, but I missed please. bedtime with material, but it's all right. <laughs> oh, thank you, thank you, okay. thank I you have, for coming. Thankfully, you, I have a husband at home who could take care of her. So, all right, if you'll identify yourself. <clears> yes, your um, thank you, Chair Pryor and Education Policy Committee members. My name is Dr. Elizabeth Bardhenka, and I'm the Vice Chair of the Department of OBGYN at Abbott Northwestern Hospital and a fellow of the Minnesota section of the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. ACOG represents nearly 1,000 providers of women's health care in Minnesota, and we as a group strongly support House File 3546. According to the CDC, protective sexual health behaviors, including condom use, HIV testing, and STI testing, worsened from the years 2011 to 2021. Among high school students surveyed in 2021, 30% reported having had sexual intercourse, nearly 50% did not use a condom with last intercourse, 8% had been raped, 9% had ever been tested for HIV, and only 5% had been tested for sexually transmitted infections in the past year. Nationally, about 20% of new HIV cases and more than half of new STIs were in teens and young adults. These trends are consistent for our teens and young adults in Minnesota. The Department of Health and Human Services released a sexually transmitted infections national strategic plan with a stated vision that, quote, the United States will be a place where sexually transmitted infections are prevented and where every person has high quality STI prevention, care, and treatment while living free from stigma and discrimination, end quote. School and community health programs have been shown to improve the adoption of positive health attitudes and behaviors that persist into adulthood, including behaviors that can reduce the risk of HIV and other STIs, decrease relationship violence and sexual assault. The CDC and ACOG support comprehensive sexuality education that is medically and scientifically accurate and unbiased and promotes healthy behavior. These programs should address the needs of all youths, including those that are not sexually active, as well as those that are. All youths deserve to be ed educated on consent, relationship violence, and sexual assault, and to be given the skills to protect themselves and others from HIV, STIs, and unintended pregnancy. Abstinence-focused education contributes to the stigmatization of STIs, associating these infections with immoral or irresponsible behavior. Stigma discourages public conversation, disclosure of infection, care seeking and treatment, further propagating the spread of STIs. Sexually transmitted infections can have both temporary and lifelong consequences for those impacted. I distinctly remember a teen patient I cared for who was pregnant. Her delivery itself was uncomplicated. Sadly, shortly after the birth of her infant, the infant became severely ill and died from herpes encephalitis. The mother had no, um, excuse me, known history or symptoms of herpes at the time of her delivery. Within a week of her delivery and after the death of her infant, she presented with disseminated herpes, was hospitalized and treated. She recovered from this infection and was counseled extensively about her herpes diagnosis, how to prevent the spread of herpes to sexual partners, as well as prevent maternal child transmission with future pregnancies. 
House File 3546 will align Minnesota law with the recommendations and guidelines supported by the CDC, ACOG, and the American Academy of Pediatrics. These changes will educate and through information help improve the health and well-being of young Minnesotans throughout their lives. Thank you for your time and consideration and I hope you will all support this bill. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony and we, we are very grateful that you are here with us this evening. Thank you. All right, having no more testifiers, we will move on to discussion. Representative Bennett. Everybody wants to go home and go to bed, I guess, okay. I'm ready too, I will keep it short. I do have a question um, for you here. On line, well, I don't know if I have the amended one. Uh, the part, 1.14 1. 1. here, no ma'am, okay. Unbiased, uh, where it talks about, it adds the word unbiased. So I guess my question is, what is the definition of unbiased? And that second follow-up question, I'll add, similar is who decides what is biased or unbiased? Representative Burke. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, uh, Lee Bennett, for the question. So what we're doing with this bill um, is to ensure that we, when we are teaching um, students about sexual health, that it is scientifically and medically accurate. Um, and so it's taking any value-based language out of it. So unbiased is, unbiased is basically scientifically and medically un unbiased, like just the facts. Representative Bennett? Thanks, Madam up. Chair. So who, did, but bias is somewhat subjective. Um, I'll give you an example. Well, first of all, I would have to say we're all biased to one extent or another. Um, and I'm thinking of a statement such as, okay, let's say we, one person says to a child, you and only you can decide when you're ready to have sex. And the other person says, it is best practiced and, and healthiest to wait until marriage or a long-term relationship before you have sex. Two completely different uh, statements based on kind of the bias of the person. So who decides if that's biased or not, or which statement is biased? I, I think that term is kind of vague, so I, you could flesh it out a little bit. Representative Berg. Thank you, Chair, um, and thank you, Lee Bennett. Um, I hear what you're saying. That is an excellent um, point. I think when we're talking about how we're teaching our students um, about their sexual health, about STIs and how to prevent them and what they mean. Um, we want to use language that is value neutral. So we are not going to say, um, waiting until a long-term relationship or marriage is the best way to prevent an STI. We're going to tell you that medically and scientifically, these are the ways that you can protect yourself from an STI. So we're not bringing value-based language into it, just medically accurate. Representative Bennett. Thanks, Madam Chair. So medically and scientifically accurate, I, I, I mean, if I were arguing that term, I would say that it is very medically and scientifically accurate that if you abstain from sex, you're not gonna get an STD or, or get pregnant, but that's, we won't argue that. I, I, I'm kind of confused as to why the word unbiased was put in here. Because we are moving, we have, we have medical information, and then we move into, in this type of instruction that we're looking at, into moral and um, religious and all those things wrapped up in those things type issues, which are by nature rather biased. Mm -hmm. And so, Again, I'm gonna go back to my point I made the other day in a similar subject that this belongs, maybe that was just this morning, I don't know. I'm getting confused, <laughs> I don't know. I have lost track of time. This, these decisions really belong at the local level where they can decide what's biased and unbiased and you know, give the major things that need to be covered and, 
and let the locals figure it out. The state can provide many, many different materials, guidelines, toolkits, all those things. Let them choose what fits their local needs within the guidance that you know, can be given through these model curriculums and things. I just, I would really encourage looking at that word unbiased, because I think it's kind of biased. So I'll stop right there. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Closing comments, Representative Burke. Certainly this, <laughs> we are getting this done in a rather fast fashion, which is great. Um, uh, I guess I will just say in closing, I, I hear you, I hear what you're saying, and as I'm looking it over, I can I can see what you're getting at. I think another way we could put it is that it's, you know, maybe non-judgmental. We're not assigning values or judgment to the information that we're presenting our kiddos. And I think it's um, it's pretty simple. It just comes down to making sure that our kids, our students, have access to the information that they need um, to to grow up healthy, um, and I I did not expect the story that we heard from our testifier, but that is exactly why we need this bill. I'm sure that story, times a thousand other stories, would illustrate how important it is to make sure that our students are equitably receiving information that is medically and scientifically accurate, so that they can. We were talking about how. Um, our brains don't fully form until we're 26 years old. So we need all the help we can get uh, to make wise decisions um, at, at a time in our lives when lots of um, decisions seem hard. And so this is an opportunity for us to ensure that students um, have the information that they need without judgment um, in their schools to, to make their own healthcare decisions. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Berg. Thank you for the discussion that we did have. <laughs> Thank you also, members, for staying um, this evening um, and participating as, as everyone did um, fully in, in the, the bills that we heard today, and it's been one long day. Yes. Um, but with that, um, Representative Berg renews her motion to lay over House File 3546 as amended for further consideration or possible inclusion in a policy bill. All right. The, bill is laid over. The meeting is adjourned. Mm -hmm.